We should probably discuss like how good the Sacramento Kings are playing. Like, oh, you think? Is... Yeah, you're trying to make sure the Kings Nation doesn't jump on us. Yeah, I mean, give well, me your take. I mean, look, they they're up two zero on the defending champs, and 100%. they're a team that you you mentioned in the lead in. Like, if you, before the season you just told them like they get one home play in play in game, that might have been like okay, like that that's a good step. We'll take that. Like they currently they just like dominated in a lot of ways the Warriors in two straight home games, and now look like the clear favorite to advance to the second round where they might get the Lakers. Like this is this situation is something it's, it is bonkers. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll for the sake of good dialogue and debate here, I'll push back a little bit. I mean, dominated is a little strong. They, you could flip it the other way and say they, they looked dominant at times. And then you look up and the Warriors are right there. Um, I, I don't remember two games, you know, like these where both sides can sit there and break it down and find all kinds of things to be hopeful about. You know what I mean? Well, this guy didn't have it going. We'll fix that. And, and, and but it's in both directions and you don't get to any clear conclusion. I think in, in terms of observations and takeaways on the King side, and I did write this, like what blows me away is that when you're talking about poise and composure and competitiveness and grit and cohesion and all those things that matter a lot, this time of year, the the Kings are not just holding their own, they are winning. And they are, you know, more specifically, since we focus so much on Draymond, a little thing that I found so interesting last night, talking to folks on the Kings side, you know, you got all these Warriors ties, Mike Brown, former Warriors coach, Leandro Barbosa, former Warrior, Harrison Barnes, Luke Laux, all the way down the line. And this group knows the Warriors incredibly well, knows Draymond incredibly well. Well, there's clearly like an unofficial edict within their team of do not put gas on the Draymond fire. So they are turning the other cheek. They are playing ball. They are competing. They are trying to, to do all the little things that lead to playoff victories while also showing what, you know, for Steve Kerr and Mike Brown, their, one of their mentors, Greg Popovich, had coined the phrase appropriate fear. They drop it all the time. The Kings are showing appropriate fear of the Warriors and their execution and, and all the things that we didn't, think they had because they had no experience together in the postseason so far they are showing yeah you know they the defense last night the ball pressure uh the fact that davion mitchell could stay on the floor because he hit some jumpers and you at one point to me during the game he i think he hit like a mid-ranger early and you were like hey he's been pretty good offensively lately and i'm like yeah, but they're still not going to respect the jumper, so it creates the same spacing problem, which makes me skeptical he can stay on the floor. But I think Mike Brown has kind of leaned into the – like he doesn't always have – you know, you're not seeing much Keegan Murray, who's one of their best floor spacers, because he just doesn't seem ready defensively. Um, and he's he's played a little bit more Alex Lynn than you'd expect. Played more Davion Mitchell, who, again, was good on Steph. Did not stop Steph last night, but bothered him enough – uh, and then Malik Monk, it's not just, hey, he's scoring off the bench. It's like a high-level energy picking up full court. He's not some elite defender, but he's just – they're bothering actions. I think they've scouted the Warriors very well because, you know, three of their coaches, you know, you can add Luke Laux and Leandro Barbosa into it, were in the Warriors' room. They they understand what the Warriors want to do, their pet actions, all that. Um, and even Sabonis, I mean, obviously at times he's getting picked on and, and brought up uh, you know, to the level of the screen, but I just think he's he's trying very hard, and that's the thing. Fox, quick hands. How did the game start? Two of those quick steals. Harrison yeah. Barnes, another name. I know we might read a story in the Athletic from Sam Amick about Harrison Barnes in the next Indeed. couple of days. He is bringing some juice. You know, his 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 hands are everywhere. He's guarding well. Two big dunks last night. Like this isn't just some pretty you know three point bombs away type team. They went nine of thirty two from three last night but one because of defense, really. You hit on something really interesting there. You mentioned Keegan Murray, uh, 15 minutes in the first game, 16 in the second, and and you're dead on about why that has been the case uh, because Mike Brown, and I think you got to tip your, your hat to him in this regard, knows playoff basketball, and he, and he knows the type of two-way toughness it takes to win these games, even with a team that has been bad defensively all year long. You know, if I was Keegan and I'm looking for – uh, kind of an inspiration right now or or somebody whose example I should follow, I would look to their, you know, the one they like to call the red velvet or whatever the hell they call Kevin Herter. You know, Herter gets out there, his shot's not falling. I think at one point 
He was 0 for 9 for the series, um, midway through game two on threes. And and that's obviously his scoring, his range is what he's known for. But he has two blocks early, a couple boards, defensively scrapping, fighting, doing just enough to not lose Mike Brown's faith, to stay in the game. And then eventually the shots start falling. You know, the Davion thing, I wrote after game one, you know, some of my skepticism that while I admire De'Aaron Fox's willingness to chase Steph Curry all night long, it feels like a losing battle over the course of an entire series because of De'Aaron's load offensively. And so, you know, plenty of that in game two, De'Aaron getting after it defensively, but, but Davion Mitchell on a playoff stage, because he does seem to be pretty composed, pretty confident, pretty tough. Like that's how you survive some of the Steph Curry minutes is applying that pressure. Um, and Mike so far is, uh, is getting the best of the coaching matchup. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, we could flip it to the Warriors side of things. They go back to San Francisco. They're down 2-0. They need to solve some rotational trouble that they're having. I mean, last night, um, they are to the point. Jordan Poole, who, by the way, you know, Clay Thompson said it game. I believe he said um, Poole's like, I think he said he was like playing on one leg, which seems like it's a little of an exaggeration. But, you know, Jordan Poole sprained his left ankle in game one. Was questionable. He he played all eighty two games this season. He usually really pushes through if he can, um, but it was a very much a question mark. I saw him pregame, like you know, with a long meeting with Rick Celebrini. Almost looked like he was trying to convince Rick Celebrini he was good to go, but he does not look like himself offensively. I think he was limited to like you know fifteen, sixteen minutes last night, like one of seven. He had that one pass where he just chucked it in the crowd. He just didn't look comfortable. Um, right. So so he's kind of been minimized from the rotation. Andrew Wiggins starts last night. You didn't see much Dante DiVincenzo. None of those two in the fourth quarter. No Jonathan Kaminga in the second half at all. He only plays four minutes. Um, you know, Kerr basically, you know, trims it down really in the fourth to like kind of like a seven-man rotation. You're still going to play Looney with the starters, but Moses Moody suddenly showed up. Like Steve Kerr searching. I mean, you mentioned the uh, coaching, like who's winning the coaching battle right now. I mean, one guy... And this is usually happens when the team wins, but one guy looks very secure in his rotation decisions right now. Like even Alex Lynn, who before the series, have you told me they're playing Alex Lynn? I'm like, you know, what is Mike Brown doing? Right. <laughs> it's working. They're plus. He's made yeah, an I don't impact, know what the man. exact number is. He's been pretty good. Yeah, he's been pretty good. I think Mike Brown smartly has only played Alex Lynn really in the non Curry minutes. It's much easier to survive against the Warriors with the backup big if he does not have to face the Steph Curry action, right? Um, but on the other side, yeah, like Steve Kerr's like Moses Moody dust off the cobwebs. You're playing in the fourth quarter of right. this huge game. So, right. uh, yeah, be, the the Warriors are on their heels. The the Kings have knocked them back. That's a surprise to many. I think pretty much 95% of the series predictions I saw were Warriors in six. For those to come true, they would have to sweep the next four. Right. I don't think, I mean, honestly, the people who picked the Kings, uh, Bobby Marks, friend and colleague from ESPN, pick the Kings. He comes to mind. Uh, I don't know that I saw anybody else other than, you know, maybe folks in Sacramento talking about it. Did anybody come to mind for you prediction wise? That pick Kings. Correct. Um, no, oh, not that I can Andrew remember. says I mean, Zach Harper did how many games, Andrew? Look at our Zach Harper out in front from Sacramento, by the way, he's a Homer <laughs> in six. <laughs> Wow, there you go. Yeah, and you know, look, this is this is a lot about the Kings, but it's also a lot about the Warriors. You know, like these were bad habits built over a bad season by them. They were high in turnovers. They were tops in the league in fouls. They couldn't close games on the road. And obviously, everybody knows their road record. You know, it was eleven and thirty. Well, now they're zero and two on the road. They didn't close either game. De'Aaron Fox lit them up down the stretch because De'Aaron Fox this season proved to be a. a great player in the clutch and the Warriors couldn't close games on the road. And guess what the Warriors did last night? 22 turnovers, 26 fouls. This is who they were all season where a lot, you know, if we were just not judging the Warriors on their history and judging them on the season, then these two games kind of make sense, right? You know, they're the lower seed. They're on the road. All their flaws showed up yeah. that we've yeah, seen yeah. all season. Uh, in a moment, we're going to take a break and bring our guy Fred Katz on to talk Knicks Cavs. But I do want to finish on the Warriors Kings front here, Slater. I know it's early. We're not we're not sending the Warriors off to pasture by any means in this series. But I do wonder your perspective on the general idea that you know the Warriors going to Game Three, knowing 
in terms of the greater stakes here that like we've written about all season long, talked about all season long, you have this potential last dance component to what they are experiencing right now. I know Steve has pushed back on it, but with Draymond's contract decision coming up, um, some other stuff like Bob if Myers. They get Bob Myers in certain future, they if they get bounced in the first round by the once lowly Sacramento Kings, um, there is going to be uh, some tough conversations with Joe Lacob and that group when it comes to paying that luxury tax bill. Um, how do you how do you see that? Yeah, I th- and I've said this all along, all season, is people, you know, I think want answers in March, answers in February. What's going to happen after the season? It's A lot of it has been, let's see how it ends. If it ends in, in another NBA cha- you know, championship, they're probably bringing it all back together. Even if it ends in the West Finals, second round in a deep series against the Suns where they look like a legit contender still. Well, Joe Lacob will pay for a legit contender. But Joe, I was watching Joe Lake, you know, sporadically last night. He's sitting baseline both of these first two games, and they have him right next to this legend section of Kings during game one. He's sitting next to Bobby Jackson. Um, gosh, Jason Williams was over there. Yesterday he was sitting next to Vladi and Peja Stojakovic, and he's, I don't want to say pouting, but he's over there, you know, he's just doing his Joe Lake of like stewing. He can't help himself. He's watching his team lose, and he's, he's huffing and puffing, and I just think them going down, easily to the Kings in the first round. And we have no idea where this is going, but if it goes that way, if it's like a five game series or something like that, and then he's staring into the off season at, you know, Clay Thompson handout, wondering if he can get a max, you know, Draymond Green trying to figure out his future and a future that he wants to be highly paid with the Warriors. Bob Myers is kind of looking around and Joe Lake of saying, I only got two home games. Let's say maybe three didn't get much money with the playoff gate that they rely on the you know tax bills going insane next year and oh by the way the new cba is going to penalize us you know x amount more in all these different ways if we have this type of tax bill i think that very much makes him more skeptical on holding it together from a financial standpoint which means i think diff various heads i don't know if you want to say heads will roll but i just think it looks much different if they go down easily to the Kings, then if they respond the next two games, win the series, get to the West finals at least, and look like they yeah. can, everyone can convince each other, Hey, we could make a run next year. 